Hi, this is Brother Richard. Today, we're discussing a lesson titled, The Nature of Reality, Part 2. And I've inserted the letter R because it's a repeat of uh, what we did in the past. Scripture teaches, in eternity, life is expressed as light. Light in motion. The motion of light is defined as one's glory. Light without motion is expressed only as light. So what we find here, we step into eternity. Life exists in the realm of light. And <clears throat> life basically is experienced radically different in the heavens than it is in our reality, which is dominated by matter. It's dominated by the element of earth, and therefore the expression that life um, regulates is different than the expression that life regulates in eternity. Here life is regulated in terms of <coughs> distance, time, length, breadth, width, in eternity, all things are dependent upon the element of light. And light is expressed in what we consider to be brilliance, illumination. Having said that, we want to take a look at some things in which the Bible reveals light is, to, is expressed. Light which is stationary, which illuminates such as the sun, the moon, the stars, is always considered just light. Light which is in motion, light which is manifesting conditions and things are described as states of glory. Where you see the word glory, and of course glory can be referred to different things other than just a manifestation of an emanation of light. But basically when it's referring to a brilliance, an illumination, it's giving us an understanding that the glory is doing something, accomplishing something, it's in motion. Turn to Exodus 24, verses 15 to 17. Moses went up into the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. On the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud, and the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. So we find that the glory is light in motion. It's manifesting a condition. It's causing a, an influence because of its presence. Exodus 40, verse 34 to 35. <clears throat> then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud above thereon, the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So what we find here, <coughs> we said that in eternity, life is expressed as light. Both are actuality descriptions of the same thing. Light, which is manifesting, it's in motion, can be expansive. It can cover an unlimited area, or it can be restrictive. The light can come down, as we find YHVH's glory, can come down and walk into the temple, the tabernacle, same glory. So it's not limited by space or condition. The light is the life of the individual who's emanating it. 
It's difficult from a human perspective to comprehend life expressed in this way because it bypasses the senses and the expressions that we take for granted. Light is, an, is a state of the expression of life in eternity. And the more the individual has the capacity to manifest light, which is life, the greater influence he has in the area of eternity that he happens to be manifesting. Yes. I understood that the waters were the beginning of light, the carrier of light. Is that the correct way of describing it? And the secondary creation. Ah, okay. So I was going to ask, tell us about the relationship between light and the waters. They're two different elements. Mm. God used the waters and uses the waters to bring life in the Eretz, secondary creation. Primary creation, light, transcends all of the elements. Okay. Turn to Revelation 15, verse 8. And the temple was filled with smoke, and the glory of the Lord glory of God, and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues, the seven angels were fulfilled. So the same thing happens in the primary creation. Uh, the expression of light, the expression of glory, whether it's in the secondary creation or the primary creation, is unchanged, unaltered. It's not limited by space. It's not uh, limited by <coughs> uh, uh, the... <coughs> restrictions that matter would ordinarily be limited by. It can expand to an infinite state. The scripture tells us, the book of Psalms, the glory of the Lord transcends, goes beyond the heavens. His light goes beyond any aspect of the creation. And it can be withdrawn to uh, an infinitely diminutive state, depending upon what the Lord wants to do. Brings us to the next <clears throat> scripture. Turn to Ezekiel 11, verse 22 to 23. <clears throat> then did the cherubims lift up their wings, the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. So this is where Ezekiel has the visitation. <clears throat> and the, uh, the cherubim come down to earth. And they're overshadowed by the glory of, of course, this is YHVH. And his glory overshadows them consistently. They're the center of what Ezekiel describes until the screen, the, 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 the attention shifts to YHVH himself and his glory. The glory basically is dominating all things. And he talks about what he does here. Verse 23, And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain which is on the east side of the city. So what he's talking about here is he's giving Ezekiel a vision of the future of the Israelites, what's going to take place. And he's showing him intricately things that are going to happen in the future. He shows them a city that's going to be reconstructed. Of course, this will be the city during the tribulation period. Gives them an intimate, detailed account of all the aspects of the city. And then he talks about the things that are going to transpire. There's going to be a judgment that's going to fall and things, other things are going to happen. But all this comes about as a result of his glory. His glory creates a reality to Ezekiel, which is undefinably real. What is this glory come from? The glory is the light in motion. So what the scripture is telling us is that the individual has the ability <clears throat> to create existence or to shut down existence by his glory by his light in motion. He has the ability to make it objective. It can be brought forth in 
objective reality or the glory has the ability to manifest it only in the mind of the recipient. No limitation to the reality that can be brought forth. Let's move to the next principle. Scripture indicates at the highest level, glory is expressed in multiple colors. Now, on the lower levels, the inference is, strong inference, is that these intelligences have one type of glory. But as you get to the highest levels of um, the heaven of heavens and probably beyond, then you get into a multiplicity of light emanation. See some examples of that. During the Revelation, fourth chapter, verse 3, he that, sat, he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sad sardine stone. So right away we see the Father emanates multiple uh, uh, colors. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. So there's a canopy, there's a covering of multiplicity of colors because he describes them as a rainbow. And in that context, it's a canopy that covers all that are within the throne area. Turn to 1 Timothy 6 chapter, verses 15 and 16. Which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Of course, talking about the glorified Lord Jesus. Who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light, the rainbow canopy that John describes, which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. John can't see distinctly what God looks like. He can only describe the colors, the glory that's emanating from this. It's like a prism of um, colors that are consistently uh, in motion from the throne. He can only see his figure of a humanoid because... John, even in the spiritual condition, is not glorified, so he can't penetrate into the light to give the totality of what the Father looks like. Yeah. Is there a, a reason why the colors are manifested only around the throne and not just from visitations or other appearances by the Lord? The glory is always bright. It's white. Yeah. Now they're, we're talking about colors. Is it only around the throne that the colors are? Yes, I believe only in the higher um, uh, regions of existence do you see the color spectrum. And I believe that, um, well, there's some instances where they did see them, they saw, we're going to go into a scripture that illustrates a color spectrum on the earth, but it's very limited and it's toned down. And I believe the reason for that is because the human race couldn't uh, stand it. Uh, yes. I'm thinking about <clears throat> um, light and motion, mm -hmm. which we understand to be glory. Is the term motion used because we're talking about God being in multiple places at the same time? Is that how we're describing motion? No. Uh, matter of fact, I'll give you a description. I was going to do that a little later on, but let's get this way. Turn to, no, right. it's okay. Turn to Revelation 21. We're going to read verses 9 to 11. It came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. Carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So he sees the new Jerusalem coming down, which of course is going to be in the future. 
but he's projecting John into this period. And then he's describing what John sees. Having the glory of God. <clears throat> I'm going to stop here a minute. I'm going to give you the definition right out of uh, Strong's Concordance of the word glory. It comes from a Greek term, doxa. It says, this word has a wide range of meanings. Glory, splendor, brilliance. From the base meaning of the awesome light that radiates from God's presence and is associated with his acts of power, honor, praise. So the definition that they give, and I hadn't looked at this before, is light motion. It's light performing something. It's light uh, bringing about a condition or a situation. And that's how I define glory is light in motion. It's not just stationary uh, shining. It's that light in motion achieving something, doing something, setting something into um, a motion. And here it talks about two things. It says, having the glory of God, so it's light in motion, as it descends, something's happening. And it says, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. So it's stationary light, and it's also light in motion. <coughs> this incorporates the bride. The bride's light, the bride's glory is being described in commingling with God's glory. Yes. Okay, so we're limited to the language, human language, uh, American language. So what I'm getting is the light is influencing. Yes. Okay. If light is not influencing, it's just light. But glory is influencing, it's in motion, it is, it's, it's not just existing, it's in, it's, it's accomplishing it something. is influencing. Uh, because light is life. Mm -hmm. Glory is light being expressed, it's life being expressed. Here in material reality, you express uh, life in a totally different way. You're doing something. Um, you may be uh, laboring, you may be thinking, you may be speaking, but your manifestation is in the element of matter. There, your manifestation is in the element of light, and it will register in a way, in other words, you will conceive what you want done, and your glory will accomplish it. Put it that way. Now, light, according to this same uh, uh, concordance description, light is not doxa. It's a different word. Light in the in the Greek is foster, and it means brilliance, splendor, light that is shining. It says her light basically was like unto a stone most precious. So it's just shining. It's not setting anything in motion. It's just illuminating. Now, Scripture teaches that the rapture, the prototokos, will inherit the glory of the Lord and function as he does. So everything you see YHVH doing, the Old Covenant, you make the rapture, you will you will exist in the same way, only on a higher scale. Turn to Philippians third chapter, verse twenty to twenty one. Philippians three, twenty to twenty for our conversation or life style is in heaven. Realms of light. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who shall change our vile body, a body composed of matter, corrupted matter, 
that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. So we will function the same way he functioned. We will emanate glory as he emanates glory, or we will just shine brilliantly as he shines. <clears throat> According to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So your glorified body is crafted to function the same way God the Father's body functions, God the Son's body functions. Only the difference will be the intensity at which it will function will be commensurate with the life you live on earth. That's why it's so important for each one of us to be in a position in which our light here becomes greater and greater and greater. Because when you are changed, you're only going to be able to express yourself to the degree to which your light illuminates. Again, I use the example of a 10 watt light bulb, <clears throat> 50 watt light bulb, a 1000 watt light bulb. And they're all light, they're all illuminating, but the degree of intensity is greater. Those that miss the rapture will never <clears throat> have the intensity of those that make it. <clears throat> now, we said that the, there was an expression, light is life. And life is expressed in light. There are times when YHVH, the Son, and the Father get angry. And the light manifests the anger. They're, they're, the anger is manifested in the concept of what happens to their light. And it's described, interestingly enough, as smoke. Turn to 2 Samuel 22, verses 7 to 9. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God. And he did hear my voice out of his temple, and my cry did enter into his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of heaven moved and shook because he was wroth. It went up a smoke out of his nostrils. Fire came out of his mouth, devouring coals were kindled by it. So it's talking about his light, his glory, is affected when he gets angry. And to the individual who's observing it, it looks like he's emanating smoke. <clears throat> Turn to Deuteronomy 29, verses 19 to 20. As you're turning, this talks about the anger of the Lord kindled against Sin, those who purposely sin against him. It came to pass, when he heareth the words of this curse, that he blessed himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace, though I walk in the imagination of mine heart, to add drunkenness to thirst. He's talking about the mind of the person that's sinning, transgressing against God. Verse 20, the Lord will not spare him. But then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against that man, and all the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him, and the Lord shall blot out his name from under heaven. So it's talking about his, his glory turns to a smoke because of his anger and is kindled against the source of the anger. Turn to Isaiah 65, verse 2 to 5. <clears throat> I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people, which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. The people that provoke me to anger continually to my face, that sacrificeth in gardens and burneth incense upon altars of brick, which remain among the graves and lodge in the mountains, which eat swine's flesh and broth and abominable things in, is in their vessels, which say, Stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. <clears throat> These are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. So it's talking, he describes himself as when his glory, when he becomes angry, it turns to a smoky substance. 
Turn to Revelation 15, verses 5 to 8. And after that, I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. The seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. So these are the priests, <coughs> angels, that have been in the temple, and receive the wrath of God in these vials. Verse 7, And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials, full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God, from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. So the glory of God goes into the temple, is smoke, it's his anger, and fills the vials of these angels with his wrath. Ultimately, the angels come out, and they're going to pour the wrath out on the earth. With tremendous results that take place. <clears throat> so the glory, the light that you express in your glorified state is no limitation to what it is can set in motion, what it can stop. It's like having an extension of yourself. Your feelings are all manifested in your glory. Your glory literally is your life. It's not your body, the glorified body, even the soul. It's the light. That's the life of you. So the more you expand in this life, the things that God has called you to do, the greater light you are building in yourself. So at the time of the rapture, those that have the greatest glory will have the highest position in the prototokis group. And those with the greatest glory, the greatest light, are going to go on to become the bride. The question is, what is God's purpose? According to Romans 8, 28, it says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So, what is his purpose that we're okay. called to? Uh, in addressing that question, uh, in its essence, you are 100% correct, sir, because I looked at it, at it and the word was singular. As a matter of fact, the plural purposes isn't even in the New Testament, it's in the Old Testament. But, Having said that, <clears throat> we find that the purpose in itself, even though it's rendered in the singular, is plural in the sense that his immediate purpose is currently bringing forth sons, as it's stated here. But in the same vein, his purpose magnifies into once the sons meet his criteria, his purpose of the glorification, his purpose immediately expands to having the sons be used as instruments for his glory. And that's rendered in Revelation, the 21st chapter, verse 7, in which we see the the extent of the plurality of his purpose uh, rendered here. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and will be his God, and he shall be my son. The son criteria is the prerequisite for him being the God of the sons. As a matter of fact, Jesus speaks about, I go to my Father and my God, your Father and your God. As powerful, as mighty, as omniscient, the Son is God, is still his God, even in a glorified state. So it will be with all the sons of the Prototokis group and everybody else in so God's will, God's purpose in the overall is to be 
God over sons. You say, why? Because God has such a awesome schedule in which two things are going to happen as a result of the sons. He is going to be glorified in an even greater way. And the sons are going to be benefited and blessed in a greater way. The scripture tells us all his purposes are always, always, always good. And in that context, you are 100% correct. Okay. So let's consider what you've said. And in addition to what you've already said, I have an additional question. And what it is, is the, um, we know that we have the down payment now. We have the earnest of the Spirit. We know that if indeed we make the rapture, we immediately get the fullness of the Spirit. Yes? So we're glorified. Yes. Yes. Then there's a period of time between that instant and then when we are engaged in the marriage. Mm -hmm. So, my question to you is, we've got the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. We've made the rapture. Mm -hmm. We are qualified for whatever that we have qualified for, whether it's fullness of adoption or partial, uh, partial, partial sonship. Um, that can be explained in a minute, but I have to get to a point. The point I'm trying to make is, so we go through this from mortal to glorified, glorified. We have the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We go through that incident. We are completely, totally glorified. After that, the consummation of the marriage happens. Is there a subtle change in addition to what's already happened? No. No. The subtle change, I just want to make sure I nail this down, forgive me for, for quickly jumping in here. There's no difference, are you saying, between the glorification of a saint and a member of the bride at the point it's been consummated? No. At the time of the glorification, everything is completed. Those that are going to be Priests, those that are going to be kings, and those that are going to be the bride. The only interlude there is the time in which the consummation takes place. And the reason for that, as I see it, is that the Father wants all the guests to witness the consummation. And they won't make it until after the tribulation period. Okay. So they've got to be martyred. Those that are going to qualify have to be martyred, come up before the throne, have time to make their adjustments. And they come up in different groups at different times. So when the last group that's going to be destined for the heavens arrives, that's when the consummation takes place, which is just before they return to set up the kingdom. So that's why it was seven years between glorification and consummation. Not because there was something going on with the people who made the consummation. No, everybody will be who he's designed to be if at that... the instant of the rapture. Okay. If there's no difference between a saint who is glorified and a saint who is glorified and also a member of the bride, what's the purpose of being a member of the bride? Calling. Explain. Calling. Everybody is called to be a priest, a king, or a bride member. But all of these three offices, if I can use that word, have the same glory, the same power, the same well, attributes. It, not in the sense that um, they're interchangeable. Each one is unique. Each one fits that particular um, nook, if you will, in which he was designed to function, in which he was called. And everybody, you know, no two snowflakes are the same. Everybody fits a unique position. What will happen, because the Father has done this from eternity, calling is placed upon that individual who will aspire to answer the call. Now you have people that are being a prototokias group that will not aspire to be called the bride position. 
they just won't. And therefore the Father has already from eternity made a predisposition. Remember what the scripture says, she hath made herself ready. She wants to be the bride. And as a result, the Father before the foundation of the world made that preparation. So in this life, she's making herself ready. The ten, the twelve, the, the ten virgins are all wanting to be the bride. But because of a human mindset, which they allow, five of them are going to be disqualified. I got the impression that the members of the bride, once they had joined um, with Christ, were somehow above all of the other Patoticus members. They're in a high position, yes. But the position doesn't give them any special dispensation. Though. Now the position is basically taken from the creation entirely into the Godhead. All the other sons are still basically outside the creation, but they are not at that level of the bride, which is a totally equal level of the bridegroom. Right. Within the prototogus group, you're going to have <coughs> levels, hierarchical levels. Just like in every other area, every creation is, everything is a hierarchy. Since the Lord has passed on the management responsibilities, let me use that term, to prototogus members, can, can we know, is there any way to know whether the members of the bride also have management responsibilities, or, they, or, or, or are they above that? In the same way that the king and the queen would have their court to manage their business. Is that yeah, how we should look at it? Exactly. Yeah. The bride member is unique in that she is now a, um, in union with the bridegroom, hmm. which by virtue of that, she's above everybody else in the prototokers group. <clears throat> the bridegroom is the elder brother. In other words, he always presides over all the other brothers. Brethren. So to be the bride means you have to be presiding over all the other brethren to be the consort of the bridegroom. The two have to be equal. Marriage is a union of equals. So the bride is going to be taken to a higher position, elevated in the sense of existence. It's as near as I can place it. To the counterpart of the bridegroom in order for them to be unified. If we go back to Revelation 21.7, mm -hmm. can we describe God's purpose, because we've now agreed that it's singular, not plural, mm -hmm. to be, to facilitate the ability for sons to exist who can then manage his business? Yes. Would you, is, is that a, a reasonable yes. way of describing yes, because it? because it says he'll inherit all things. So he, he exists purely so that he can have his business managed. Well, no, but that's the essence of his responsibility, to manage the inheritance of the Father. Okay. Yeah. We know that God the Father is a reality personified. He's a reality that creates all other realities. Is that what we're headed for? Yes. YHVH is a reality personified. Because when uh, he speaks to Moses, he says, Who's, Who should I say sent you? He says, Tell them, I am. I exist. Statement of um, being a not a person, but being a state of being personified. And he's a created being. No problem. I just want to add one other, one other aspect. To the bride. Hmm. It says, to her was granted that she should be arrayed in linen, uh, clean and white. Actually, the word white is there is bright. <clears throat> so she has to be arrayed in a garment that is commensurate with the garment of the bridegroom. She can't have a garment that's lesser than the garment of the bridegroom in its glory. So it's talking about that in the sense that she's set apart from even the rest of the Prototokis group because she's gone 
the, the, the garment illustrates her level of um, elevation in existence, elevated to the consort, to the counterpart of the bridegroom, so that the two can um, be equally yoked. The, the, well, basically, that they can consummate and become one. Marriage is an equal is a, is a is a union of two becoming one. So in that context, the fathers made arrangements with a bride, one who seeks that position <clears throat> to reach a stage of such elevation that she is taken directly into union with the bridegroom and it's illustrated by the, what she's wearing. Well, even a wedding, a bride, uh, her, her wedding dress uh, basically stands out over everything yes. else. Yes. Does it not say that the wedding gown that she's wearing is a compilation of the righteousness of the saints? Yes. So we're talking about purity, really, aren't we? In glory, state of glory. The intensity, the, the diff, what I'm saying is the difference between the, the members of the bride and those of the other Protagoras members, the intensity of purity. Yeah. Explain the righteousness of the saints, how that translates into her covering. Well, everybody's robe is a robe of righteousness. It's what enables us to stand in the presence of God. It's light, refined light. And when you read, when Jesus was transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration, it says his robe was uh, white as the light, which is righteousness. And the bride will have a garment that's commensurate with his garment, in brilliance and glory and in basic um, purity. Spirit to spirit. Spirit to spirit. Okay, so now, when man was created, he wasn't given a language right away. He's controlling, he's ministering to the angels, I mean to the animals. He's in charge of the garden, he's dressing and keeping it. Um, and then, all of a sudden, there's a communication between the devil and Eve. There, he, she is beguiled. So, is it a was it uttered? Did he vocalize? You know, at what point did beings vocalize? Immediately, as soon as he was created. Because the Spirit basically gave him all the understanding that he needed. Nobody had to, told, to tell him about what families were all about. He's the first man on the earth, but when the Lord brings Eve to him, he immediately knows. This is going to be my wife, we're going to have children, blah, 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 blah. Spirit gives understanding. There's a mother tongue that the human race spoke, which was given to them by God. And you read about that, of course, in Genesis. This is a, the earth was one language. So when the Tower of Babel was erected, they can, he confused the languages. So... Give me some understanding about what's, what's going on. Well, basically what he did, as I see it, is he, through the language, broke the human race into families, uh, clans, tribes. You find today language groups basically center around the ethnicity of people. This broke down at the Tower of Babel. But uh, since they were on the physical plane to begin with, all they would have to do is to break the spiritual communication in which they would understand language and would break down to uh, the resonance. Whoever is part of your group, that's who you can communicate with. The other groups are outside. So in heaven, there's only one language? It's not language. It's spirit. You'll notice, um, matter of fact, turn to Revelation, fifth chapter. Oh, 
Revelation, the fifth chapter. <coughs> Verse 9 and 10. They sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, and tongue, and people, and nation. Kindred and tongue. So you have every, every language that's spoken on the face of the earth, around the throne, and they're all singing in unison. How long did it take for everybody to learn everybody else's language? Instantaneously. It's a spirit that brings unity into... You might... One guy might be speaking Japanese, another guy might be singing in German, but they both understand and they flow in harmony. Like on the day of Pentecost when people from all over the world that all spoke different languages gathered and they listened to Peter, and they all understood him in their own language. Yes. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. So, we also know that there's angelic language. Yes, angelic tongues. Paul talks about that. Well, the, the, <coughs> the only example you have of that is when Paul got taken to the third heaven. You heard yeah, words. Unspeakable you words, yeah, sure. Okay, so do you suppose there's a different language between the Don Stars and the Cherubim? Uh, no, there's no problem in communication because, again, it's spirit. So it wouldn't matter even if there were a, a different language. They wouldn't have any problem communicating. Okay, well, the thing of this is we're, 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 we're highlighting the language that Paul recognized as being angelic language. So we also know that we are going to communicate. Do you suppose we're going to be speaking or is it going to be spirit to spirit? Depends on the level that we're on. There are times in which you will vocalize because you're going to come down to lower levels. Yeah. But if you're at the prototokius level, you won't need to. Yeah. 